Hello and welcome to Estero Church Online. I'm Pastor Chris. It's great to be with you today, so thank you for joining us. Welcome to church. Today we start our new sermon series, Wisdom for Faithful Parenting. I'm looking forward to diving into this with you. But now, if you're not a parent, don't tune out just yet, okay? No matter who you are, there will be opportunities to use this knowledge and share it with those around you. And I think no matter who you are, this series is going to help you understand God better and His love for you. Do you want to know how God sees you? And do you want to find out more about His heart for you? Then stick around for the sermon to hear more. So, we're two weeks into August. How has the prayer calendar been going for you? I hope it's been good for you. It's really helped me demonstrate the love of Christ to people that really need it in my life. And if you haven't been doing it, it's not too late to start. Click on the link in the chat to see it and download it. After that, just fill it in with names of people that you feel led to prayer for. Family, friends, acquaintances, whoever. And on the day that you pray for them, just reach out to them and ask them what you can be praying for. And I know it sounds simple and maybe redundant if you're already praying for people, but trust me when I say that the prayer calendar is worth it and God will use it in your life. Now, if you're new or if you haven't filled out one before, make sure to fill out a Connect card right now and you'll get a free gift on us. Click on the link in the chat right now or find our Connect cards by going to our website, astero.church. Connect cards are important because they help us connect with you. And if you're new and you're looking for a way to get involved, this is it. Next, let's talk about some announcements. Tomorrow, August 15th, the Faith Works team is hosting a missions meeting at 6.30 p.m. This is a missions meeting for anyone at all who's interested in learning about missions at Astero Church Online. There's no commitment required, so if you're interested in how you can be a part of missions through Astero Church Online, come and join the meeting and hang out for a little bit. It'll be a fun, informal meet and greet about how we can work together. And if you're live, you can click on the link in the chat to let us know you're interested in coming. And if you're not live, feel free to email me at ctimpson at astero.church for more information. Please come out if you're interested in that. With that, let's now enter into worship together. And as we worship, I want you to be thinking about what makes someone a good parent? Share in the chat with what you think makes someone a good parent. The big word that comes to mind for me is patience. So if you're watching live, share in the chat right now with what you think that is. Let's worship.
Thank you for the music, worship team. So what makes a person a good parent? I'm sure we could all come up with a few, but I now want you to take it one step further. How does God stack up to that? Does he have that attribute that you thought of? I know for me, patience, love, teaching, truth, all of these things are ways that God parents us. So really, being a parent is a lot like trying to emulate God, right? Interesting, isn't it? Think about that. The next form of worship we'll take part in today is worship by giving. As God's people, we give as a response to the biblical call to do so. When we give, we're being obedient to God, and by giving, we grow in both our reliance to God and we grow in our trust to Him. So if you'd like to give, you can click the link in the chat or go to our website, astero.church, and click the link at the top of the page that says give. With that, let's enter into today's sermon on parenting. Hey everyone, it's so great to be with you again at Astera Church Online. As you noticed, uh, I am standing in one of our children's ministry rooms at our church campus. And for the past several weeks, we've been thinking and praying a lot about parents, families, and children within our church because this week, uh, kids went back to school here in Southwest Florida. And so, that's why I'm here today, and we're going to be talking about parenting. We're going to be talking about families. We're going to be talking about how do we invest in our kids as followers of Jesus. My kids went back to school uh, this past week. It's kind of hard to believe how fast the time has gone by. Uh, my three kids started pre-K, second grade, and third grade. And yet, I still remember what it was like becoming a parent for the first time. When my oldest daughter, Catherine, was born, I remember having so many different emotions that day. Of course, I felt a feeling of joy, happiness, and celebration that my baby girl is here, that she's healthy. There was a feeling of shock. Oh my goodness, this baby is here. This is a human being that I'm responsible for. There was also a sense of pride. I was proud of my wife for how well she did in delivering our baby girl. I was proud of Catherine for making it through that. And of course, I was proud to be a dad for the first time. And then on top of all of that, I definitely felt super nervous. Okay, this baby, this thing is here now. What do I do? How do I not break her? How do I care for her well? Will I know what to do when something goes wrong? If you've ever been a parent, I'm guessing you remember having similar feelings or reactions. Now, of course, over time, we settle in a little bit. We learn what to do. We learn how to change a diaper, how to take care of a new baby. But then that baby gets older and grows up. And from being, becoming a toddler to a young kid, adolescent, teenager, life changes. Challenges change. There are new obstacles to overcome in being a parent. The reality is, over the lifetime of being a parent, that big question never fully goes away. How do I do this? So over the next few weeks, we want to try and answer this question just a little bit in our series that we're calling Wisdom for Faithful Parenting. Obviously, we can't cover all the challenges or answer every question, but we're going to look for God's wisdom and discuss how to apply that wisdom to our modern context. Through this series, we hope to share some biblical wisdom with you as it pertains to parenting. We want to try to figure out some ways that we can be faithful parents. And of course, along the way, we want to try to provide you with some practical tools and strategies that you can use. For those of you who aren't currently parenting kids in your home, we believe this series can still benefit you. Maybe you're a grandparent. Maybe you don't have kids at all. You're just a young married couple. Or maybe you're single and you're really focused on your career. No matter what your life stage is, I think the Lord wants to provide wisdom for all of us about how to influence others and point them toward a life of faith in Christ. So we really hope this series blesses you in whatever life stage you're in. 
Because let's be honest, everybody, when it comes to investing in others, especially the responsibility of parenting, we all need a blessing. Parenting is hard work. It's one of the most important and hardest jobs there is, and you get almost no training for it. When it comes to being a parent, you don't go to college and get a four-year degree in it. You don't have a formal orientation where the HR department checks you off and says, okay, you're good to go. Parenting is a job where you have to learn on the fly. And when it comes to parents in the Bible, it's clear that they struggled just as much as we do. There are countless stories in scripture about difficult parenting situations, and they were not all handled perfectly. Think about the stories of Abraham and Isaac, King David and one of his sons, Absalom, Ruth and Naomi. Even when we look at scripture, it's clear that parenting is messy. So, where do we begin? Let's look at Proverbs 22, verse 6. It says this, Train children in the way they should go. When they grow old, they won't depart from it. So, if you've been around church or are familiar with your Bible, you've probably heard this verse before. This verse is often quoted when it comes to the topic of parenting. So, this seems like a decent place to start. God's Word says, Show children the way. Help them learn the way they should go. When they grow older, they'll know that way and they won't stray from it. But if we're being brutally honest, it might be hard to believe in that verse. Many of us know people that have turned away from the Christian faith. I've had conversations with numerous folks in our own church that have seen their kids or their grandkids walk away from following the Lord. Now, I've recently been reading a book about this phenomenon entitled Sticky Faith. In this book, and it's a great book, I recommend you reading it if you want to learn more about Christian parenting. Dr. Kara Powell and Dr. Chap Clark wrestle with why kids walk away from their faith when they grow up. Based on multiple research studies, Powell and Clark conclude that anywhere from 40 to 50 percent of kids that graduate from a church or a youth group fail to stick with their faith in college. There are multiple studies that support their findings. The percentage of young adults that leave behind their faith is just deeply saddening. And so that brings me back again to Proverbs 22, 6. Let me read that for us one more time. Train children in the way they should go. When they grow old, they won't depart from it. So what are we missing here? Now, I am trusting in the truth and power of God's Word. I have seen God's Word change my life and others' lives in powerful ways. So I'm not just going to throw this verse out the window. But how do we reconcile this verse with the reality that many people do seem to walk away? Well, I believe that God can do His part. I believe that God can hold up His end of the bargain. So the question then becomes, how do we do our part? How do we train our children? What do we need to change about the way we are training them? What type of training do we need to offer our kids so that they don't walk away as soon as they are able to do so? So to begin to find some answers, I think we need to look at some people that did have a sticky type of faith. Even when their spiritual parent left, they continued to follow Jesus. And for that, we're going to look at the book of First Thessalonians. Now, before I read these verses for you, I want to set the stage a little bit so you'll see how this passage provides some parenting wisdom for us. The Apostle Paul, during the New Testament times, visited a city called Thessalonica. This was on his second missionary journey. When he was there, he planted a church, and the young church grew rapidly. Unfortunately, the church also came under some harsh persecution from some local Jews, and things got dangerous quickly. Paul had to run for it, actually leaving the city in the middle of the night. 
And so 1 Thessalonians is a letter that Paul wrote a little while later trying to reconnect with this young church. Now, Paul wasn't in the city of Thessalonica for very long, but I think we're going to see how he made the most of his time there. So please read along with me, 1 Thessalonians chapter 2, picking it up in verse 7. Just as a nursing mother cares for her children, so we cared for you. Because we loved you so much, we were delighted to share with you not only the gospel of God, but our lives as well. Surely you remember, brothers and sisters, our toil and hardship. We worked night and day in order not to be a burden to anyone while we preached the gospel of God to you. You are witnesses, and so is God, of how holy, righteous, and blameless we were among you who believe. For you know that we dealt with each of you as a father deals with his own children, encouraging, comforting, and urging you to live lives worthy of God, who calls you into his kingdom and glory. So let's spend some time looking at the relationship Paul has with the Thessalonians. It is clear that he cares deeply about these people. Based on the rest of the letter, it seems like the church is actually doing pretty well. Paul doesn't mention any big heresies or mistakes that the church has made. They seem to have kept a firm hold on their faith. They haven't walked away, even though Paul is no longer with them. And these verses that I just read for you show us how Paul trained them to continue following Jesus on their own. So let me highlight a couple of verses for us. First, verse 8. Paul writes this, Because we loved you so much, we were delighted to share with you not only the gospel of God, but our lives as well. Now, don't miss the significance of that last phrase. We shared not only the gospel, but our lives as well. Paul says, we shared our lives with you. We lived among you. Our efforts to tell you about Jesus weren't just about our words. When we invited you to follow Jesus, we did it with words and actions. We lived out our faith in front of you. Look again at verse 10. Paul writes this, You are witnesses, and so is God, of how holy, righteous, and blameless we were among you who believed. Paul reminds these people, we were holy and righteous among you. We lived with integrity. We demonstrated the right way to live. For Paul, his invitation to follow Jesus was about so much more than just teaching. Paul modeled a life of faith. Not only did he tell them about Jesus, he showed them how to follow Jesus. He demonstrated how to pursue righteousness every day. He displayed how his faith impacted every aspect of his life. Therein lies the wisdom the Lord has for us today. For us to be faithful parents, we have to model a life of faith. We have to show that our faith is a part of our real lives. We have to demonstrate to our kids that we are following Jesus. Our children not only hear what we say, but they see what we do, and that certainly applies to our faith. They notice how we react to struggle, how we respond to failure, how we deal with mistakes, not just their mistakes, but our own as well. They see the way that we live out our faith for better or for worse. This is why Paul has such a profound impact on the Thessalonians. He didn't just preach a sermon and then leave town. He didn't just point his finger at them. He didn't just criticize, lecture, or threaten them with discipline so that they would behave the right way. He lived his life among the people. He showed them how he followed Jesus himself in everyday real experiences. If we want our kids to embrace a life of faith, then we have to embrace it first. If we want our kids to ask for forgiveness, to respond to disappointment with hope, to control their emotional responses, to turn to the Lord for guidance, 
then those things have to be part of our own lives. And we also have to live that type of life with them. We have to ask our children for forgiveness. We have to control our emotions in front of them. We have to seek guidance from scripture and prayer in ways that they can see. We have to share the gospel and live our lives as well with them. So let's spend a little bit of time talking about what it looks like to model a life of faith. Let's go back again to 1 Thessalonians. Read these verses with me. Paul writes, Just as a nursing mother cares for her children, so we cared for you. And then a little bit later, Paul writes, For we know that we dealt with each of you as a father deals with his own children, encouraging, comforting, and urging you to live lives worthy of God, who calls you into his kingdom and glory. Paul talks about caring for the Thessalonians like a mother and father. These are examples for us. We should be modeling the life of a nursing mother, a mother that is tender and provides what her children needs, a mother that gives of herself her very own life to make sure that her children grow. We should be providing a life of love, safety, and closeness for our children. We should also be modeling the life of a caring father, a father that encourages that comforts his children, that cheers them on, that is there for them in hard times. A father that urges children to live a worthy life, in a sense, calling them upward to greatness and saying, here is how we can live in God's kingdom. These are great ways we should be investing in our children. But I wanna make sure that you don't miss the most important point. Look again at verse nine, Paul writes this, Surely you remember, brothers and sisters, our toil and hardship. We worked night and day in order not to be a burden to anyone while we preached the gospel of God to you. For Paul, the most important thing is the gospel. He bent over backwards to make sure that was the focus of his life and relationship with the Thessalonians. Paul believed in the gospel so much he trusted in the gospel so much, it was his passion. So yes, we do need to be caring as a mother, we need to be encouraging as a father, but most of all, we have to model trust in the gospel. In Sticky Faith, Powell and Clark go to great lengths to say that our children need to receive a sincere and authentic understanding of the gospel from us. And more than that, they need to see how the gospel impacts our lives before it can impact theirs. Our children need to see us trust in a God who forgives us and loves us when we fail. They need to know that we trust in a gospel that sets us free from the power of sin and that our trust in the redemption of Jesus Christ is real and is personal for us. We have to trust in the gospel and know that God's love for us is not based on performance. We have to trust in the gospel and believe that we can never earn God's blessing or favor. We have to trust in the gospel and embrace the truth that we follow Jesus because he first loves us. If we start there, we have so much better chance to model the life that we want our children to have we can model a trust in the gospel. If we start there, we can show our kids that we trust God with our careers, with our sicknesses, with our futures. We can show our kids that it's okay to wrestle, to struggle, to have fears, to have doubts, because our trust in the gospel is bigger than those things. For our kids to develop their own authentic faith, we can't just make it about church attendance, following the rules, achievements, accomplishments. We have to show them that the gospel is about forgiveness. It's about grace. It's about an invitation to follow Jesus within every aspect 
of our lives. We have to show our kids that the gospel is about being set free from sin to live the way that God wants us to, not because of rules and regulations, but because it's a life of freedom and joy that the Lord wants us to have. Developing sticky faith in our kids has to start with our own faith sticking to us. Listen to this quote from Sticky Faith. The greatest gift you can give your children is to let them see you struggle and wrestle with how to live a lifetime of trust in God. You will be disappointed, discouraged, and maybe even thrown around a bit at times. You likely will even wonder if such a life is really worth it. But as you faithfully hold on to the God who has taken hold of you, the life you live and model will be a beacon of hope and direction that no sin management faith can hope to achieve. As you trust in the gospel and the Lord who saves, your sticky faith will help your children discover their own sticky faith. If we want to be faithful parents, we have to model a life of faith. That life of faith starts with us. It starts with us understanding the gospel message of grace through the resurrection of Jesus Christ. It starts with us trusting in God through the difficulties of life. It starts with us letting the gospel shape everything about our lives. Then our children will see it and the Lord will help them find their own faith and stick to it. So at the beginning of the sermon, I. I said that one of our goals in this series is to address some practical issues. And so before we end today, I want to quickly try to apply some of today's biblical wisdom to an important parenting topic. And so I want to talk for a few minutes about mental health challenges in our kids or grandkids. Now, the CDC says that approximately 17% of kids ages 2 to 8 have a diagnosed mental or behavioral health disorder. We all know that anxiety and depression are on the rise in kids, especially in teenagers. This is a real challenge, a real issue for parents and grandparents. Now, I'm not a licensed counselor or an expert on this topic, but I've leaned on the wisdom of other professionals to offer a few practical strategies for you today. So as you're thinking about how to parent or grandparent kids with anxiety, depression, or other mental health challenges, here are just a few quick tips for you. First, engage in active listening. Even though our kids may pull away from us when their mental health is affected, we need to keep trying to listen. We have to offer to have conversations with our kids whenever they're ready. We have to consistently ask them how they're doing. And different kids with different personalities respond differently to this. And you just got to make the effort to figure out how to best help your child open up and talk about how they're doing. Our kids have to know that we're available, that we want to hear, even when they're struggling, even when things are hard, that we want to listen what they have to say. Second thing we can do as parents is we can affirm and love our children constantly. Kids dealing with anxiety, depression, or other challenging mental health issues need to know that they are loved no matter what. They need to know that their parents are in the struggle with them. Now, one practical thing you can do to help affirm and love your kids is by repeating or memorizing what I would call self-affirmation statements. These are just simple statements uh, that you would have your child repeat regularly so that that truth about who they are can sink in to their minds and their hearts. And obviously, Scripture provides a wealth of wonderful statements we can speak over our children and over ourselves. Here's a couple quick examples. I am loved by God 
and my identity is found in Jesus. Another one, I am strong and mighty. I have the power of God inside me. Or, I can trust in God. His peace guards my heart. You can use self-affirmation statements like this every night before tucking in your child to bed or every day before you drop them off for school. You repeat these statements so that the truth of what God says about your child sinks in to their hearts and minds. Third quick tip for parents dealing with mental health children challenges in their children is just simply be willing to get professional help. There is no shame in seeking help from a professional. Sometimes you just need a little help from a school guidance counselor, a licensed therapist, or a pediatrician. Lean on the expertise of others to help you support your child well. Lastly, I want to remind you that the wisdom of God we've already talked about today also applies to this parenting situation. The best chance we have of raising mentally healthy children is by modeling a pursuit of mental health. So make sure you are using these same strategies for yourself. Talk to others about your own mental health challenges. Make sure that you're engaging in conversations and that you have someone else who can listen to what you're going through. Speak affirmation statements over yourself. Those same statements that you might offer to your child, speak them over yourself. They are true for you as well. And of course, get professional help if and when you need it. Make sure you're taking the time to read resources about your mental health challenge or go see a therapist. Whatever you need, get the professional help you need to be healthy. Model these things for your children and you'll help them find victory as well. I'm really praying that this message is help for, helpful for you today. Parenting is hard work, and I am cheering you on. Wherever you are in your parenting journey, whether you're a parent, a grandparent, or you're hoping to be a parent someday, remember, it is never too late to invest in your kids' faith and in your own. If we are willing to model a life of trust in God's gospel, then we are inviting our children to do the same. And that will be one of the best parenting decisions we can ever make. Let's pray. Gracious Heavenly Father, thank you, Lord, that you are the best parent we could ever have. Thank you that you are a loving Father who is always present and available to us. Thank you, Lord, that you are always willing to forgive us, to listen to us, and to help us overcome the challenges we have. Lord, I pray that all the parents who are hearing this message today would be encouraged. Lord, in the moments that are hard, in the moments where it just seems hopeless or you don't know what to do to help your child, I pray that you would provide a spark of hope, that you would remind us that we are not alone in this journey and that you want us to depend on you. Give us, Lord, a trust in your gospel message. Give us a trust in who you are, that we are redeemed through the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. And may that hope be infectious to our children. And may they see us live a real life of faith so that they will want that life of faith as well. Lord, bless the parents, bless the grandparents, bless any who are investing in young people today. Thank you, Lord, for your grace and presence. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Thanks for the message, Pastor Mike. The call to being a parent is a big call but it's not all that different than the call to be a Christ follower. We are called to be images of God so that others may see and learn about Christ through us. What does that actually look like? How can we do this well? 
Lucky for us, Jesus lived a perfect life. And even though Jesus didn't parent in the traditional sense, he left all the tools we need to be as much like him as possible. If this has opened up a lot of questions for you, or if you want to dive into any of those questions a little bit deeper, stick around after service and chat with me in the live service, or you can email me at ctimson at astera.church, and let's talk. Now, receive the benediction. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord turn his face toward you and give you peace. Have a wonderful week.